Welcome back to our Intermediate Financial Accounting class. In our last few segments, we've been talking about investments. Investments in stock and investments in debt. And we've done a bunch of examples as well as talking about the concepts involved with recording these entries. Now, we've done examples of available for sale and trading with equity. We've done an example or started an example with available for sale and held to maturity, which is a debt security that you purchased for the purpose of getting the interest payments and the principal payment, not to take care of its fair value or to resell it on the market. We've done some of those journal entries, but at the end of that last segment, I asked you to take some time and do the last part of that debt example on your own. And hopefully, you came up with something that looks like this. If it was a held to maturity security, we would start with the carrying value after the last interest payment. Now, I didn't worry at all about what I did with my fair value because this is the held to maturity example and I don't care about fair value. So that's irrelevant here. We take the 93,925, we multiply it by the effective interest rate, sold to yield 12%. That gives me 11,275 for this period. So I record that as my interest revenue right down here, debit my cash for 10,000 and the difference is this 1271. And then I take that and put it into my T account and you can see that after the second interest payment, my discount has dropped from 7210 originally to 4804 at the end. Now, if I were doing held to maturity securities, that would be it. I would be done with that journal entry and that adjustment to my T account. But we also wanted to see what happens if it was an available for sale or trading security. Same method, either way, just a slight difference in account names. So if I was doing an available for sale security, I would make that same journal entry, same calculations, same numbers, everything. Then I would have to figure out the market value, which we were told, it's right up here, 97,000, and the new carrying val value after amortizing away some of that interest. So I go back to my T accounts, I start with face value of 100,000, 4804 is my remaining discount, so I now have a carrying value or book value of 95196. And we see that used right here, 95196, which gives me a fair value adjustment balance of 1804. That's what I want my T account to end up with. So I went back to my T accounts, and I see that I've got that 1804 down at the bottom, right where I want it. If I started at 425 credit, I want to be at 1804 debit, then I need an adjustment of 2229. And that becomes my journal entry for the fair value adjustment if it's an available for sale security. And here's the entry right down here. So I debited my fair value adjustment and I recognized an unrealized increase decrease. That's how we do it if it's available for sale. Now if this was trading, it would all stay exactly the same. The only difference is I would record my fair value adjustment to trading or to cash equivalents and then instead of unrealized increase decrease it would be an unrealized gain. That's the only difference between the two. Hopefully that makes sense. I know that process is very involved but it's important to understand again that even if it's an available for sale or trading security I have to amortize away the value of a premium or discount because I've got to get back to that fair value number. The next thing we need to talk about with our investments is what happens if we decide to transfer from one category to another. So for example, I start out with a bunch of securities that I thought were trading, I was just going to day trade them, and I realize, hey, these are making a lot of money. This would be great to help me handle my pension obligation. So because they're making so much money, I'm going to get them out of trading and put them into this long-term portfolio. So I do it. How do I make the journal entries for that? Well. We're going to take a look at an example of that, but the basic concept is I transfer it over at the market value on the day that I make the transfer. Not the old historical cost, not the fair value adjustment amount, but the market value on the day of the trade. And as long as you can remember that, you'll be good to go. So let's take a look at this example of a transfer from one category to the next. So Acme Corporation purchased 10,000 shares of TTFN. We decided originally that they were going to put them into trading securities. We're going to do the journal entry for the original purchase and then we'll take a look at what happens later on when they decide trading is not the place that this should be. So for our original per purchase, let's see, 10,000 shares, $10 per share, so we're going to record this at $100,000 and, 
And again, we've mentioned this before, but I'm going to mention it again. I would also add my broker fees here if I had any. And we don't have any information about that, so we won't worry about it. But, but just be aware, that becomes part of this as well. So we'll put this into cash equivalents, which is the most common place that we see trading securities, although you could also have a trading securities account, literally called trading securities. This is the purchase of 10,000 shares of TTFN at $10 per share. And they're trading securities. After three months, TTFN stock price has increased to 15 bucks a share. They've decided that's really doing a good job. We don't want to keep it in trading securities. We just want to ride this out. So let's move it into our expansion fund. Now, not only do they want to transfer this 10,000 shares that they've already got, but since it's doing so well, we're going to buy 5,000 more shares. So we want to make the journal entry to record both the purchase and the transfer. And we're going to start with the purchase. So let's see. 5,000 shares, 15 bucks a share, it means that we're going to spend $75,000, or Acme is going to spend $75,000 on this second purchase. So this is our second purchase, and it looks just like the last one, except we're going to put it straight into the expansion fund. purchased 5,000 shares of TTFN common stock for $15 per share. And that takes care of the purchase. That's really straightforward because I'm just buying new stuff and putting it right where I want it. Now, we've got to do the transfer of those other 10,000 shares. And again, the key here is that we're going to use the market value not what we paid for it, not the market value at the last time we did a fair value adjustment, no, the market value on the day of the transfer. All right, so let's do our transfer. And we'll come up here, 10,000 shares at 15 bucks a pop is $150,000, and that's what I'm gonna put in to the expansion fund. Now, I have to take out of my cash equivalents what I put into it. I can't take out 150000 because I only originally showed $100,000 going into that account. And I, I can't take out more than I put in. I'm going to take out exactly what I put in. The difference goes into a cleverly named account. You ready? It's called an unrealized gain on transfer. And if the value dropped, then it would be an unrealized loss on transfer. But it's unrealized because nothing's really happened. I haven't really sold this stock. I haven't really gotten that extra $50,000. But I've got to show this, this market value when I move it into the new account. Now, this is an income statement account. It doesn't matter if I'm transferring from health to maturity to, to available for sale or available for sale to trading or trading to available for sale or what. No matter what kind of a transfer it is, that's an income statement account. It doesn't go into comprehensive income and get put on the balance sheet like an unrealized increase decrease for an available for sale security. This is transfer of 10,000 shares of TTFN common stock to available for sale status or something along those lines. Doesn't have to be exact wording here. That's how I record transfers. Pretty straightforward when we do a transfer. The one exception is if I transfer from available for sale or trading into equity. And that's a little bit more involved. We're not going to get into that now. It's a more advanced topic. We're going to leave that for your intermediate two class. We have to leave some of the fun for them. But just be aware, this method works really well between held maturity, trading, and available for sale. But when you go in and out of equity, there's more involved. So for now, just file it away conceptually you get to do that in more advanced accounting classes. So we try to provide some of those previews of coming attractions just so you know what to look forward to in future classes.
Let's take just a second and talk about financial assets under IFRS. So instead of the three categories that we normally use, IFRS has four categories. So we have financial assets at fair value through profit or loss. We call it trained securities. They have this big, huge name for it. They call it held for trading. That's what we call available for sale. They have a held to maturity investment account. That's our held to maturity, so same there. And then they also keep a separate loans and receivables account. Other than that, there's really not a lot of differences. Other than having four categories instead of three, the only other significant difference between US GAAP and IFRS is the fact that we can't transfer securities in or out of what we call trading, what they call financial assets at fair value through profit or loss. Once you put it into that account, it stays in that account. And if you don't put it in there, it can't go in. So you can transfer between held to maturity and available for sale or held to maturity and held for trading, but you can't go in and out of the trading portfolio. All right, we have just one last topic that we need to discuss, and that is what do we do with equity securities? And we will start working on that in our very next segment. I'll see you then.